good evening, folks. Welcome to the City of Geneva City Council Chamber for tonight's special City Council meeting. I kindly ask our City Clerk to please take the roll call. Bruno? Here. Berghardt? Here. Ruby? Caven? Here. Kilberg? Here. Kasserog? Here. Maladra? Here. Marks? Here. Mayor? Here. Swanson? Here. We begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd like to ask uh, Alderman Gabe Caven to please lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a uh, statement to make prior to jumping into the business this evening, and I ask for your indulgence. Following this statement, I will ask the council for any questions related thereto, and then we will commence these deliberations. As all of you know, we have one item on tonight's agenda, and that item is to consider ordinance number 2022-33 amending the BlackBerry plan unit development and approving a special use for a wireless communication facility at 1800 West State Street. The petitioner is Tower North Development, LLC. For background purposes, this matter has received a full public hearing on July 14, 2022, before the city's planning and zoning commission and pursuant to the city's regulatory review and approval processes is now before this council for deliberation and a final vote. The public hearing before our Planning and Zoning Commission was the opportunity for a full vetting of the petitioner's plans and requests. Because our Planning and Zoning Commission is duty bound to take evidence, undertake questioning, and otherwise conduct a full evidentiary hearing of the items with full public participation. Again, that public hearing was concluded on July 14th after approximately three and a half hours of testimony and questioning. Consequently, the official public hearing process is concluded and the record adduced has been preserved for tonight's special city council meeting. This council has reviewed the record, referenced and must why do I feel like uh, I'm, I'm at Yankee Stadium here? <laughs> Got that muted? <laughs> the council has reviewed the record reference and must now address the petitioner's request or requested action items based solely on the record as it exists. No new information or testimony may be considered. So I respectfully remind everyone present this evening that while we invite citizens to provide public comment on this matter, any comments provided will not be and cannot be added to the already closed public hearing evidence established before the Planning and Zoning Commission. And tonight's proceedings do not allow for the back and forth of questions and answers. Put another way, there is no cross-examination allowed by residents of the council members professional staff, or the petitioner and their agents. However, the city council may ask the petitioner or staff for clarification on any of the information that was presented during that public hearing. To reiterate, the public hearing process is complete and all evidence has been received and all necessary testimony is concluded. If anyone this evening wishes to comment about the item we are addressing, I and the City Council respectfully request that your comments be germane, brief, and perhaps most importantly, avoid repeating what has already been said by a prior speaker. You have no doubt noticed that there is no sign-in sheet this evening to speak. I will simply identify interested individuals by asking for a show of hands. We will begin identifying speakers on the south 
side of the council chamber and continuing in a clockwise motion to the north side of the chamber. You will be afforded the opportunity to speak only once. You will not be recognized a second time. With the utmost respect, I ask that anyone who does wish to speak, please direct your comments to me and only me. Lastly, and on a personal note, we know that sometimes people get a little nervous speaking in public, let alone knowing that, on the off chance you don't, these proceedings are being broadcast live via AT&T, Comcast, and Metronet, as well as the city's internet page. So prior to joining us at the podium, just please relax, take a deep breath, and then I will ask you to share with us your name, and then the floor will be yours. Now, if there are any questions from any member of the city council, please advise now. I will do my best to answer those or defer to our city attorney. Any questions? It's now my pleasure to ask one of the members of the council to offer a motion to consider ordinance number 2022-33, amending the Blackberry Plan unit development and approving a special use for a wireless communication facility at 1800 West State Street, the petitioner being Tower North Development, LLC. Is there a motion? Mr. Marks makes that motion. Mr. Caven makes that second. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a brief presentation by our friends via Tower North, LLC. And then following those questions, I, I will ask a question of the council with regard to proceeding thereafter. Hmm. Well, good evening. My name is Ray Schenkel. I'm with the Insight team working closely and representing uh, Tower North and Verizon Wireless. And we are here seeking, as the mayor had said, uh, a special use and an amendment to the PUD to allow a stealth uh, wireless communications facility at the Oscar Swan property. Um, I do not plan on um, bringing up any new material, but I did feel it was important to highlight some of the items in the application and some of the things that came up at the hearing, and then I can answer any questions you have. Um, I'm also joined by Jesse McDaniel. He's the Verizon engineer who provided the RF affidavit and the testimony at the hearing. Um, I also have Mark Peseda. He's in here. He's here. He works closely with Ari, but Ari was sick and couldn't attend. And we also have Mark Lane who submitted the application and the real estate analysis. And then finally, we have Angie, um, for Angie Fry, who is the Verizon attorney. I seem to have trouble getting the, oh, here, there we go. Are you all set? You're good? Otherwise, yeah, otherwise help is on its way. <laughs> I think, there we go. Okay, great, thank you. So um, as we discussed, um, I know you're familiar with these types of applications and facilities. I know you read through the project report and I know you watched the video. But some of the things that we want we talked about at the hearing is how Verizon is here to keep up with the insatiable demand that we all have for seamless wireless coverage. And how reliable everybody probably in this room has come with these smartphones and all the things that they do. Uh, we talked about how important it is to have a robust and seamless wireless network for the community, especially in light of what has happened, the recent tragedies in, uh, in the Chicagoland area. Uh, we talked about how OD, over 80% of 911 calls are made from wireless devices, and how the number one reason people cite for purchasing phones for the elderly and for their children is for their safety, so that they can track them, they can reach them, and they can make calls. So, with over half of these users cutting their landlines, this is their only form of communication. It's extremely important for Verizon to keep up with this demand. They're the number one carrier in the country. And they take that very seriously. Jesse McDaniel, Jesse McDaniel is one of many RF engineers that monitors the network every single day, works with their sales and marketing team to find out where there's troubled areas. We have a detailed uh, RF affidavit and testimony explaining 
why we need this site in this location, explaining that the existing sites that surround it are maxed out with capacity and there is a coverage deficiency that is only going to get worse over time. And this precision of this site is extremely important to cover all these areas listed here, Route 38, Randall Road, Geneva Commons, and all the surrounding residential business areas. We talked about the search ring that was provided. This depicts the coverage and you can see the difference in the color. It's a propagation tool to show how the coverage is different in the area with the yellow and the tan being poor coverage and how the search ring is a guide for someone like myself or Mark to give an area that we, they need a new site in this area in order to offload the surrounding sites. Um, we go to the center of that search ring and work like a corkscrew and work around to find a site that not only that we have an interested landlord, meets the coverage objective, but also meets the city code requ uh, requiring uh, for wireless uh, antenna facilities. There are certain requirements that we need to meet. If we can hit all those items, now we have a viable candidate that we need to pursue. We have that with Oscar Swan. And you can see the impact it has on the network. Jesse talked about this at the hearing. He is available to answer questions. But most importantly about this site is that it hits right where we need to be and it offloads. All three sectors hit the area and, and offload where the surrounding sectors have that problem. This is the site here. It's located in a B1 zone and it does abut residential. It is very difficult to find a site that isn't abutting residential in Geneva. There's a lot of residential zones. Um, but what we're proposing tonight is not unusual. It's not uncommon in Geneva and it's not uncommon in the surrounding communities. You have two water, uh, two water tanks with multiple carriers on them right in residential areas, butting right up to residential with the exact same antenna facilities that we're proposing tonight. This is not unusual. I won't go through all the photo simulations, but we did do the um, balloon test with the crane at 100 feet, and you can see that it's very difficult to find a site that blends in as well as this. Um, and I drove around that day for four hours, and it was very difficult to get certain angles because of the tree canopy. Um, the wireless uh, facility is a monopine which is in harmony with your code uh, as far as the stealth facility. But um, we think this is a great site with all the tree canopy that helps disguise this, the facility. So the four main objections from the P, uh, for the planning and zoning hearing was the look of the monopine. Many of the remonstrators felt it looked terrible. Um, but I just want to remind the council that this is the preferred stealth facility that is listed in your code. So we are only following what was preferred in your code. Now, we happen to agree that we think it does look right, but know that if we could do a standard monopole, that is preferred because it's cheaper and quicker versus going to have a stealth facility made. Um, people fear that it will be detrimental to property values. Now, none of those claims were backed by a certified appraiser. We provided uh, an analysis in our application, but know that existing intended facilities and tower sites that are in Geneva and the surrounding areas have not been detrimental to property values. So that's important to note. Um, RF emissions, it was made clear by your attorney that this site will meet all the guidelines set by the FCC and match all the existing frequencies that are in Geneva and the surrounding area. And then finally was the PUD, restricting SUPs on the property. The PUD dates back to 1987. In 1985, there was 340,000 wireless phones in the country. Uh, five years later in 1990, there was 5 million. Today, there's over 290 million. I don't think it's fair to have that PUD. It was nine years before the Telecom Act, and I don't think it's fair to have the PUD restrict something and overrule what is spelled out in the special, in the standards with the special use regarding uh, wireless telecommunications facilities. So one thing to note before we wrap up is that just to remind you that Cityscape is your third party consultant that the city hires to review wireless antenna facility special use applications. They reviewed it and agreed that it met all of the standards. Your staff reviewed how we addressed the standards regarding special use applications and they agreed that we checked all the boxes and met all the standards. So we respectfully disagreed with 
the Planning and Zoning Commission. We do think this is a win-win. We think the site meets all the city code requirements for placement of new antenna facilities. We think it, we think it allow, we know it allow Verizon to meet their demand for the uh, subscribers and provide coverage to the Geneva community and the emergency services. And we think it's a well-disguised stealth facility that will also offer co-location to other carriers. So I am here, we are here to answer any questions. I appreciate the opportunity to open up tonight. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> Ray, can I trouble you just to hit the escape button on yes, that? Yes, I can do that. Or just knock the whole thing over. <laughs> Hold on. As promised, uh, I will ask the council a question, and that question is very straightforward. Is it your preference to begin deliberations amongst yourselves, or do you wish to hear from residents joining us this evening before such deliberations take place? I will defer to the majority of the council. Mr. Maladra? Uh, so, uh, first a question, and then an answer to your question. Of course. Uh, given your opening statement, are we allowed to question? Yes, you are. Okay. So my preference would be that we go first, um, primarily because I think you all will appreciate being informed by what you hear from us before you tell us what you've already told us through all the emails and phone calls and things. Uh, so that's my preference. Anyone object to Mr. Malaja's preference? No. My preference is the same. Ms. Mayor's as well? The chair determines that the preference is to begin deliberations by the council members first. Those deliberations can include questions of the applicant, questions of the staff, clarifications for either Mr. DeGroot, Ms. Dawkins, our city attorney, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, who would like to go first? Apparently Mr. Maladra would, then Ms. Mayor. <clears throat> I, always, I always get my stuff out of the way first. Then I can just sit and listen. Um, in your in your four main you reviewed the four main objections raised at the PVC. The last one was the PUD restrictions. My question for you, my first question for you is, when did you learn about the PUD restrictions? To be honest, it was um, after we sent the notice for the first hearing. Uh, the staff had realized that it was part of the property and that we needed to. Um, table the first hearing and then file the application for the PUD so, so in it time, was that was, was in uh, I believe uh, God it was had to be March or April so in March or April you knew that you were looking at a site that had restrictions on it what what made you think that these restrictions would be uh, no longer applicable aside well, from the fact that you want to put a cell phone tower there well, we filed in December, and again, what we felt was that the PUD was back in the 80s, nine years before the Telecom Act, and it didn't account for the need for a wireless network or the need for new wireless facilities that we're proposing. So we thought that the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council would see that as outdated and go by the special use standards. But the, the cell tower, in terms of use type, it's not a commercial use, it's not a retail use, it's not a residential use. The closest comparison would be it's a utility use. Mm -hmm. What is it about the PUD restriction that would make anybody think a utility would be okay there and now as opposed to 1987? Because in 1987, like I said, there was, there was 340,000 zones. Now there's 290 million. Um, these people have gone reliant on a on a reliable network so if there was if there was some insurmountable physical problem at that site you guys would be hosed you couldn't do anything I, i'm sorry are you saying there is no alternative well what i'm saying is that this meets all the requirements and we think it's a great site it's in the area and it checks all the boxes. If we were gonna go at the Planning and Zoning Commission, people asked if we could go to the east towards Geneva Commons. And if you're gonna go in Geneva Commons, now you're, the only room to put it would be in that front parking lot. 
So you're talking about putting a large lease area in the middle of the parking lot. I don't even know if you could get the variance for parking, but also it would stick out like a sore thumb. And there's no room outside. Yeah, it is. Well, well, there's no, what I'm I, saying I, is there's no tree One canopy. moment, Mr. Sh I, I failed to mention, but I will now since the guffaws. Um, let's be respectful of everyone who has the podium, um, irrespective of their position or perhaps some of the words they deliver. So just so we can proceed with uh, a modicum of civility, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. What I meant was there isn't a tree canopy to disguise the majority of the tower. You'd be out exposed in the parking lot. Looking at it, there's no room back behind the Geneva Commons, and if there was, you're putting it right up against residential that you'd be doing it tonight. It'd so we felt that this site was a better site. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't so much interested in the specific alternatives, just more in terms of how, how it is that this site becomes so indispensable. So my take on it is we have a PUD that carries with it certain restrictions. Uh, the way I look at it, that was very forward-looking. It was looking at all the possible ways that Geneva could change and how things might put pre different pressures on us. An example, in 1987, there was no, well, I got to be careful. Maybe Amazon existed, but I doubt it was going down Allen Drive 500 times a day in 1987. So if Amazon were to come and say we wanted to put a warehouse on that site, we would still say we have PUD restrictions sort of protecting us from that type of use in that specific location. So um, what, I'm at, what I'm looking for is what is it about what you're proposing that would, that would say to us that that foresight that we exhibited back then um, is actually detrimental to Geneva. And I, all I'm hearing is so you want to put a cell phone tower there. So that's why I asked if there was some it, physical it's tough to find you a, wouldn't want to put a cell phone tower there. It's tough to find a site that meets the city requirements and meets the coverage objective. It's very difficult to find these. So we found it. So And we have testimony with the RF statement how, how important it is to the Verizon network. So I don't know if an Amazon warehouse is a fair comparison, knowing an Amazon warehouse is... Traffic. extremely large and this is a much smaller footprint it was a um, <laughs> so but I mean I understand what you're saying but okay. I feel like this is more in harmony with your code than than another type of industrial business use that would be proposed here all right thank you <clears throat> miss mayor um, and then mr. Swanson so um, you say it's in harmony with the code um, and that you wouldn't so you reckon you're stating that you knew about the special use prohibition prohibition in March we had filed in December I can't remember if it was March or April but we were moving forward with a hearing and we had sent out the notices and Chayton with the staff came back and said wait a second we have a PUD amendment you need to file this and include this on the notice so we did it as soon as we could, and then the next agenda we could get on was July. But you'll have to forgive me without checking it. But it might even been late as May or June. You, I mean, I'm assuming that you go around and develop these towers at other locations as well. Is mm -hmm. that right? Correct. So this is something that you do for business. You're a developer of the tower properties. Is that accurate? Tower North works with Verizon. Verizon got out of the tower business. They're in to building the network. So whenever they can't co-locate on an existing structure, they work with agents like us, Insight, to find sites. And then they partner up with a tower company like Tower North to do it. So it's, they're kind of driven by both parties. We work for both of them. But it's the last thing that they want to do. They want to get the network up and running. Um, but when there is no other alternative, that's when they work with Tower North. Okay, so, but as you go and look at properties to locate these monopines or monopoles, whichever you choose, mm -hmm. that those are proprietary to your company, those designs, the monopole and monopine? No, so Tower North can work with, uh, they, what they normally would propose in a situation, this is just a regular monopole, but when the zoning code requires stealthing facilities, like a 
Sometimes they build a monopine or a monopalm down in Arizona or California, or they work with a stealthing company that can build that for them. It's a lot more expensive to build. They don't like to do it, but if in order to meet the code, uh, they'll do it and they'll team up with a stealth company. So you referred to it as sticking out like a sore thumb at the commons, but here on Oscar Swan's property, it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. Well, again, I know it's subjective, but if you look at the photo simulations and you can only see the top portion of the monopine, I feel that blends in well with the landscaping. I know that's subjective. But um, the, the branches don't start until 26 feet in the air. So how do you know many conifer trees that their branches start 26 feet up, except in maybe in the north woods of Wisconsin? I believe that that tree canopy is there is 40 to 60 feet, depending on the tree. So you're going to have that blocked by the base of it. You're not going to see that base of that monopine. Except if it's in your backyard. Uh, you again, you, if, you, if you've driven over there, that's a very thick tree canopy. I live, I live right there. Okay. So I live within the 500-foot radius. Okay. So I walk around that neighborhood very often. And I was, I was present for the balloon test. It was on my birthday, so I stayed home from work to witness your balloon test. So I'm, I'm pretty, I went all the different places you could go, except for Oscar Swan, because if they decide to put this on their property, uh, that's really their business, except for the fact that they're putting it on the furthest point of their property, the point that is closest to residential, not, not next to where their business use is. They're putting it closest to my neighbor's houses in their backyards. So as far as a special use goes, it's not a use that's consistent with Oscar Swan's business. It's something so repellent to them that they've put it in the furthest corner of the site so that it's not seen by their guests, but it's in one of my neighbor's backyards, uh, a good friend of mine. It's in another person's backyard, and they moved already. They sold their house as soon as the development page populated with this possible uh, pine tree in their backyard with equipment around it. Um, the apartment, people that live in the apartments nearby, I mean, they, they will see this every single day from their windows. So Oscar Swan's site is protected because it's shielded by the trees on that side, but these people that live in the neighborhood that their homes are there and that were protected by the PUD that stated no special uses are basically not being treated fairly in this case. And regardless of what the appraisals say about a quarter mile, a half mile, five miles, you know, next to a tower, uh, by the water tower where the, where the antenna's 200 feet in the air. Uh, no, or, they're more, they're 50 feet. They're, they're 50 to 60 feet on that water tank. I just drove by it for the meeting. I just want you to the understand. The water tower, tower itself is 200 feet tall. Right. Correct. Oh, yeah. That might be 150 to 200 feet tall. Correct. So I just want you to know the antennas. The antennas are on the top. No, the antennas are on the leg and on the stem of the tank. Okay. Well, that property is also surrounded by a gorgeous park facility that is our high school's, uh, you know, athletic facility. So the property values there are buoy buoyed by the fact that they're on a beautiful park. I mean, I think that's fair to say. Um, but there's definitely people that are impacted very, very severely by this. And anyone who would say that having this device in their backyard would not affect that property's uh, value, it just, I mean, it's not even credible to talk about it. I would need to see the, the proof. With all due respect, Did Alderman, you, these are, these are these are common among the landscape. And I just drove by the water these tank trees, by Geneva. These monopines are no, common. But these antenna facilities are common along the Yeah, they're common on a water tower. Common on a water tank, and then there's towers as well. So, okay. again, well, I, I... I really, with all due respect, I mean, some of the things that you've said, like it's not fair that um, this would have been uh, established as part of the PUD because there were there were not 290 million phones. I mean, this town, my father was an alderman too, and he was around during the time when that PUD would have been set up. 
and forward thinking? Absolutely, because we had just spent years and years and years and invested, I mean, I don't even know how much money in burying all of our electric over the years so that it wouldn't be an eyesore through the community. We still have areas that are, that are uh, landlined electric, but this neighborhood that you're going right up against, it was one of the first neighborhoods that was built with all in-ground utilities. Now you're going to come in and say we're going to broadcast uh, radio frequency right over your homes and with this very unnatural tree. I mean, it has seven layers of branches. Um, I build high rises and we put antennas within our building to disguise them. We do DAS systems. You have other options. You represent the tower company and I think you're here because uh, you found a place for a tower not because it's absolutely necessary and the only solution. You've said it's very difficult. Well, I think you're going to have to go back and try some more because this is not acceptable. Um, if it was acceptable, Oscar Swan would put it right in front of their house and that would be, it would be concealed, but it's not in front of the house. It's not even close to where they're going to be doing their events. So. Let's not put it in people's backyards either. All I got. Mr. Swanson, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. A uh, couple questions. Yes. You mentioned in the circle, the uh, target circle, was where you started to look, and then you went outside of that when you couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. I was struck by the map showing the coverage if this were to be placed. And in that, it seemed to me that the Geneva Commons did not improve significantly. So, so my question is, is this in fact achieving one of your main stated goals, which was State Street, Randall Road, and Geneva Commons? Uh, so in, in looking at the map, Geneva Commons remains light blue instead of the purple. So does that mean that another one is going to have to go in to the west or where, where do we end up if we put this in? I'm going to defer. I'm going to ask Jesse to get up and explain how this site, how this site meets the objective since he is the RF engineer. He, he did provide the affidavit and testimony, but I'm going to ask him to get up and explain why this is so important to him. So. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Uh, name is Jesse McDaniel. I'm an RF engineer with Verizon Wireless. And uh, I guess to answer your question, uh, so this site is very important to our, in terms of our network because it has two objectives. Uh, coverage is, is a gap in coverage. Um, and with this site where it's located, um, it will uh, close that gap and also become a dominant server in the area, right? And also offload the sectors that we need uh, you know, immediate relief because they hit capacity. Um, to answer your question, as far as the Geneva Commons, um, you, you see, you do see that there is light blue coverage in the area, so it will become the dominant server. So, as far as um, the coverage that we need in that area, that this site will uh, hit that objective and also carry the traffic that we need it to carry. Well, it seemed like most of uh, the Geneva Commons was in the light blue before. I mean, there was a little bit of green on the map. It, it, uh, to me, it, just looking at the map, it doesn't look significantly improved from before and after. Yeah, the, well, based on our analysis, it will, it will be the dominant server in that, in that location. Can I move so. Just one second? Just to clarify, I just want to ask Jesse to leave him in the question. The map is just to help. It's a guide to show. It's not specific it's not as detailed as the actual coverage it's that the narrative that you provided in the affidavit and in your testimony that how oscar swan meets it we shouldn't the guy the map isn't carved in stone correct that's correct. that's correct so it's just a guide to help show as a tool that there's the gap but it shouldn't be as specific as yellow and blue in those those yeah. instances okay i typically like my guides to be fairly accurate when I'm looking at it to make a decision. So that's why uh, we provided the narrative on top. 
I, okay, uh, that doesn't make me feel super comfortable, but uh, okay, I, I will take it. I will move on to my next question, and, and that is, um, in your uh, presentation earlier, you stated that it's not uncommon for this type of tower to abut residential, particularly in the Chicago area or Geneva. Yet, when I look at the information you provided us on home values, you gave us four examples of which none of them appear to be anywhere near residential. Or, and in fact, they're more near cornfields. And so if it's not uncommon to abut residential, why was it difficult to provide us with detailed information on property values? If it's happening all the time, we should be able to see that. So, so that was a, a red flag for me to see that. I, I did look at the presentation earlier and the uh, appraiser said he wanted something in Geneva. However, none of these are in Geneva and we don't have a lot of cornfields in Geneva. So, so that to me seemed to be a flaw and, and I'd like to hear why there were not other examples available. Oh, I can answer, you can sit down. Mark, would you like to get up and explain some of your analysis? Mark Lane is the applicant. He wor we worked together at Insight. He submitted the analysis and the application. So maybe he could explain his line of thinking. Good evening, Mr. Lane. Good evening. How are you? Um, so the, the objective and what we were trying to accomplish was to um, look at it. I was trying to look at some sort of data that, that would indicate some sort of differential in, in property values versus uh, for uh, uh, pro homes, properties, you know, most proximate, most proximate to the tower, and then um, uh, properties as you as you got farther away from the tower to see if there was any any um, measurable difference. And you know, the the, prop, the problem you run into in Geneva, obviously, there aren't really any towers in the town except the water tank um, near the high school. Um, I did subsequently uh, do a, a test of, of, of the uh, sales prices around that water tank, and there was no appreciable difference, uh, you know, closer, closer to the tank uh, and getting farther away from the tank. So um, if, if that was an indication of the impact of antennas, just the antennas, um, I, I, I didn't see anything there. Um, if the uh, impact was attributable to something visual, like the appearance of the tower, uh, you know, and, and these other towers are actual uh, standard monopine towers, or monopole towers, excuse me. Um, I, there, there aren't really any in, in Geneva in residential areas. So what I tried to do is find towers that were proximate. Um, and then as, as I expanded uh, in circumference out from, the, uh, out from the, the, the tower location, I was starting to capture residential properties. Um, you know, when we're doing statistical analysis, we need some sort of, uh, of quantity of data to make some sort of a reasonable uh, inference from the data. And um, th that was the only way I could figure out how to do it. Now, that being said, um, I, have al I also did a study similar, very similar to this in, uh, in Wilmette, Illinois, uh, where the tower is right in the middle of a residential subdivision, an established residential subdivision. Um, and I, I found the same results. Um, the, the, the homes in the immediate surrounding neighborhood right around the tower, um, as you expanded out from that tower, there were no, um, there was no difference in property values. In fact, the homes closest to the tower were actually uh, incrementally more valuable than the houses as we got away from the tower. So, um, I've done quite a few of these studies in, in a new, you know, numerous areas, and I, I always seem to come up with about the same result. It's, it's no impact. So you could have included more applicable to this site from a different community. From a different community, I, I was asked to try to to try to show a a local impact. So I did try to stay uh, near approximate to Geneva because that was what I was asked to do. But yeah, I, I do have examples outside of this area that that confirm what I presented in, in this report. I, I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't matter to me that if it's in Geneva or Batavia or St. Charles, what matters to me is that what happens when you have a cell tower 50 feet from your backyard. Sure. And that's the question that needs to be answered, not that it's Geneva-centric. Sure. So, and, and, and I'm not sure that I have the data now to make that conclusion. So just looking at these four samples, uh, quick looking at Google Maps, the Kesslinger and Brundage 
it appears that there's one home 640 feet away. You go to McKee, it's maybe three homes 600 feet away. You go to Randall and Cleason, it appears that there are two, two homes, one east, one west. Kirk and Geezy, four homes, and they're across Kirk Road, and they're about 500 feet away. So, so they're very different than this one, where it's literally 150 feet from a yard. So, so I, I don't think we have apples and apples to look at. So that, that makes me uncomfortable on the property value side. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Caven, sir. Thank you. Um, I know that you kind of talked about or cited the fact that, you know, that, that PUD was put together in 1987 and there was a lot less um, cell phones, obviously, um, than there are currently. So maybe I was getting the impression you were taking that as that was either, you know, not forward thinking or not, or not knowing exactly what things would be like in the current state, but at the same time, those things were put in there to make sure that there were no special uses in there moving forward. And I think a lot of the residents who live over there have expected that to remain the same. Um, and to my knowledge, since 1987, there have not been any special uses granted for any reason, which is sort of what that was written for. Um, so I just wanted to point out that they maybe, and obviously they weren't thinking specifically about cell towers, so I don't think it's that you know, you're being unfairly, um, you know, treated poorly. This is the way that anybody who's wanted to do anything there has been. So I think that that's um, fair, to, fair to point out. Um, in talking about the PUD amendment, I know you said that maybe it was May or maybe it was June um, when you determined or you determined with the city. But with you developing these and, and doing this regularly, Whose responsibility is it to know what forms or requests are going to be needed for a specific project? Uh, I believe the applicant and the city, when we filed, they, they right, it should come up in the title and we should know about it. So, yes, it was probably a miss on both parts. Um, but, again, with the reason that we talked about earlier, we felt it was worth amending and including that because we felt that this, you know, the special use standards tied to wireless facilities and the federal law would, would override that. Well, and if you didn't file that amendment, then we wouldn't be here having the discussion, though, either, right? I mean, you didn't have a choice to file that amendment or not file the amendment. Oh, correct. Right. We, okay. To move forward with special use, otherwise, if we went through the special use and got approved, it wouldn't have been viable because we missed the <clears throat> PUD amendment, right? Okay. Um. And I know this has sort of been talked about already, but and I certainly agree with this. Um, for the special use standards, specifically um, the use standard two, the proposed building or use will not diminish the value of adjacent and nearby properties. And I know we just had um, the real estate professional or appraiser um, up here to, to give some information as well. But for some of these homes, when it's you know 70 feet, 200 feet, and you know what, maybe that isn't more than 15 or 20 or 30 homes that are really all that close, but I don't think there's any way, I don't feel like there's any way that you can say that those homes that are specifically right there, somebody who's a mile away, I don't know if that winds up having making a big difference or not, but I think that it's difficult I find it difficult to believe that somebody whose backyard is is right there and that tower is 70 feet away, that they're not going to suffer some type of financial impact. And if that's exactly what special use standard number two says, I don't think that I don't think that this request um, meets the intended um, the intent of, of of what that special use number two is. So. I think that that is all I have at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Kosarog, then Mr. Bruno. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had a question that um, was coming to me a lot while I was listening to the PZC meeting, and you referred to it again in your presentation tonight, and that's 911 calls, how important they are. Mm -hmm. um, certainly agree with that. but. From a technical point of view, how are 911 calls handled? Are they prioritized or do they just go in the queue 
with the same guy who's talking about his auto warranty. Yeah. I'm going to defer to Jesse on this since he's a reader for engineer. Jesse, do you mind getting up and speaking about that? All right, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. My question is, are 911 calls prioritized on the cellular network, or do they just go in a queue and could be dropped like any other phone call? Um, to answer your question, they are prioritized, but if for some reason the site is uh, at capacity, um, there, there will be some blocking of calls, right? Um, and we some are, blocking of 911 calls? I'm it, sorry to interrupt it's, you. It's a possibility. Um, it, ha it happened in... Um, the recent event that happened uh, up north, right? We did have some blocking of calls because there wasn't enough um, capacity and then also coverage, right? Um, if you don't have adequate coverage in a certain location, uh, those 911 calls can be in jeopardy, right, of going through. So, um, but they are prioritized. Is there, how, it seems like you guys would want to know how often a 911 call doesn't come through or gets dropped or, things like that. Do you have any information on that? Uh, no, I don't have the statistics on that. I just think it's, uh, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate right. it. I, I just think it's a, a little frustrating to hear you use those emotional sort of uh, context there, uh, talking about elderly people having cell phones and things like that when, um, you know, we know that 911 calls are prioritized, and that's really not an issue here that is going to make a difference probably with the new tower. Um, I, um, I was also concerned about the, the Geneva Commons coverage, as Alderman Swanson said. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to, to um, echo what everybody else is saying about the, the PUD and how it was forward thinking. Um, you saying it's not fair because it was before the Telecom Act, I, I just don't understand that. I think it protected all these residents, the value of their property, made them comfortable in investing in Geneva. Um, you know, I think this is exactly, exactly what it was meant to do, even if they didn't have the foresight to know that cellular was going to be 2.9 million phones. Um, uh, I did have a question about the appraisal and I, I'll just ask it to you maybe you know uh, before we bring up Mr. Lane but are, th are the appraisals taken over time you know so he, for example Mr. Lane said some of the properties went up in value as they got closer to the tower was that within the last year or two when the market was up are we looking at some historical data here or how does that work how are, how are we not capturing how do we know we're not capturing just an uptick in the market that really is unrelated to any cellular tower. Mark, I'm going to have to defer to you. I mean, my feeling is that property values have been increasing over time, but I'll let Mark, he submitted the uh, report. So. Sure. Um, yeah, that, that's a, a really good question. But the, uh, the, the data that I pulled was before, uh, before the uptick in the market. And I went back... Um, I believe it was 18 months um, prior to the to the date that I that I pulled the data, um, so we were capturing you know um, uh, you know pre increase in market and all the data that we that I pulled would have been subject to the same market conditions. So yeah, markets do go up and down, but the the sample would have all been relative to each other. If that makes sense. I guess just that I. I do understand what you're saying with them all all being it, but I say I guess it really comes to mind when you say, well, some of them increased in value as you got closer to the tower. Well, it seems to me that could have been a lot of factors, uh, you know, that may or may not have included the impact of the tower on the property. Maybe they would have increased more without the tower. Maybe other properties. Just there's there's other things that could have happened here, or no? Is that accounted for in your calculations? Well, so um, I guess the assumption would be that 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 if the tower was causing an impact, the the properties closest to the tower would 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 bear would would uh, bear that out, right? They would they would they, they, you would see some sort of indication that that those um, that those homes closest were were 
um, selling it at a, at a price below homes that were farther and farther away. Um, um, you see, some of the, that granularity that you're asking for, I, I don't know how you would really measure that. Um, I don't know that you can erase. I mean, if, if, you, uh, if you standardize the data and, and removed any percentage increases or decreases attributable to, um, to market conditions, you should still see the differential based on, on spacing, I would think. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess my, my last question, uh, maybe for staff, um, maybe it's not relevant, but um, in reading the um, consultant report, I guess I was just wondering if the PZC uh, amendments included enough of their recommendations, uh, such as antenna socks, uh, maintenance of the branches, uh, decommissioning, and things like that. Has that, maybe you can just answer before we call up. No, that's Director a good DeGroote. question. You know, um, city staff can attest to this that these sites are maintained and upgraded several times over the life of the agreement. And a lot of times, you know, for example, there's landscaping requirements in order to get it approved. And sometimes that landscaping gets wind burned or dies. And when the applicant comes back in to file for replacing a cabinet or an antenna, that's when the city says, also, your requirement was to have this landscaping. We'd like you to fix that. And the applicant, that's part of the building permit review process, and that's when they catch up and clean that. I wasn't really referring to the landscaping itself. I was oh. more referring to the faux branches right, and but things I guess, like that. What I meant was that could be part of the requirement to say, hey, you need to check in every however many years to make sure that the tree, the, the aesthetic integrity of the tower is still intact. And what, you know, and we could have that be part of the building permit that they maintain that and keep that in the integrity of, of the stealth facility, meaning that the, whatever, the, the, let's say the pines fade because of the sun or whatever the case is. Or a storm that, comes by and knocks correct. them off. Oh, that, no, the requirement time. for that. Yeah. yeah. Stuff Absolutely. like that. So they just need to be notified. They have thousands of sites. If they're notified, hey, you're, you're in violation of your building permit or your zoning approval, we need you to come in, then they'll have to do it. Absolutely. That, that's what I would recommend. That's how they do it with the other sites. Um, you know, for example, a rooftop site, if they have a stealth panel in front of it um, and it's damaged or whatever the case is, then the city notifies them that it's not in compliance and they have to fix it. And a lot of times, they're made, they're, once the site is built, there's a self technician out there one to three times a month. They'll notice if something's wrong and they'll take care of it. But if not, if the city notifies the appropriate parties, they'll, they'll be required to, to maintain it. Okay. Um. I think that's all my questions for now. Thank you. Mr. Bruno, sir. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I do want to start by uh, uh, saying I, I, I do believe um, the stated need for this in terms of, of coverage. I, I don't think you'd go through that eff such an effort to uh, for a tower you didn't need. Um, that being said, um, I the the faux pine is I you you said you would prefer just a standard monopole <clears throat> um, the concealed monopoles can do they have the capacity for co-locating also when you say concealed, like the flagpole yeah like flagpole um, n no they really don't they I've done a number of flagpoles and the problem is the antennas you have an array of antennas mm -hmm. that's that stick out right and those antennas sometimes can be six to seven feet panel and a foot and a half wide. If you're now going from six to nine antennas to now three, because you have to have them wrapped around a pole and have to have them a smaller size, that hurts the capacity, right? So now the only way that Jesse can get it to get six antennas, he has to stack them. So instead of going having six with a full array at 95, he has to go three at 95, and those antennas are smaller, and then put them below three at 85. Sure. And start, you start to go down, and now it really becomes a single carrier pole. Okay. 
Okay. But I agree with you on, on the monopole. It's a slicker style, but again, it's subjective. So. Um, okay, so, that's, so that answers that. Um, uh, I want to ask another question, but I would defer to counsel. Uh, uh, if you can, if I ask the question and it's out of order for what we can ask, if you can just let me know. Um, uh, I know there's there's uh, there's basically an open cornfield across the street. Um, the the property across 38 um, was was that considered? So when you look at what Jesse states in his affidavit and his testimony is that the sites surrounding it. The sectors you have three sectors facing typically zero degrees 120 240 right those sectors facing Oscar Swan are getting hammered so what you really ideally want is to put antennas an array of antennas in that sector so all three of those sectors offload that traffic when you move it to the west now you only have one sector facing this is actually or northwest north northeast so you'd have or excuse me did you say northeast or uh, it's just across the street it's it's not almost literally. across route 38 yeah yeah there's a cornfield i yeah i i'd have to look at i don't know what maybe mark i don't know if you searched that area you have to meet i i, I don't know about that candidate it would involve a different city council <laughs> oh, it's St. Charles. <laughs> okay, I understand. That's St. not <laughs> the reason I bring it up. No, I understand. So it's St. Charles. I, I know that we. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that Mark would have looked at anything and everything possible, and there has to be a reason. Maybe he couldn't. They couldn't come to terms with that landlord. We can't force people to lease to us. So sure. maybe that was what the reason for that. Um. <clears throat> And the uh, probably the biggest bugaboo with me is listening to the description of the uh, the property values and the increasing radius. Um, and what I didn't see is a radius. And I understand it would be difficult to do a 600 foot radius because, mm -hmm. as has been said here, I think there's a big difference between being able to throw a stone at it mm -hmm. and seeing the top of it from a distance. I'm, I have a, uh, you know, my duty to those residents back there comes, comes to, uh, comes into play. Um, uh, so now back to the uh, PUD. <clears throat> uh, when you identified the site, did you run a title search regarding the underlying real estate? Yes, they must have, yes. Okay. Um, if so, so, just to clarify, uh, with with respect, your response was they must have. Do we know Verizon, for certain yeah, whether it was done? They did. Title search was done. Yes, I apologize. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, and, and why again then did it take till mid June to file a peti petition to amend the PUD? Uh, when we filed in December, we had a number of revisions per the staff, and then it wasn't caught by either party, um, the staff. Or Verizon until we had sent notice of the public hearing. That's when Chayton said, "By the way, there's a POD on here. We have to amend this." So that's what happened. Um, uh, it seems like that falls falls to you. If I wanted to build a hog slaughtering, um, I would I would look at the property and know that I need to see what the restrictions are there. Um, uh, I think I've, um, that's it for now. Thanks. Forgive me for the interruption, but I've just been advised that there is a uh, vehicle outside with their lights still on. It is a, for what it's worth, a Cadillac. So if anyone's driving a Cadillac and the lights are on, we do not provide jumps as normally City Council proceedings, but if, you, if you're the vehicle, just a heads up. That was actually from the passenger inside the car. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Mr. Kilberg, sir, floor is yours. I'll be brief. Uh, uh, this is a development on the other side of town. I uh, actually live in the third ward and uh, live on the east side of uh, Geneva. And uh, actually, I have a 
cell tower on top of a water tower within 300 feet of my home. And again, I, I don't think we're comparing apples to apples here because uh, a water tower and its aesthetics are completely different than a standalone cell tower, I believe. And uh, uh, there's not too many times I look up like this to see if the cell towers or the uh, cell service is still located there. But uh, um, I think that uh, Alderman Caven and Alderman Mayer uh, have uh, raised uh, a number of the same points that I would have raised. Uh, I, I really don't have anything else to add other than uh, uh, I really appreciate the citizen involvement on this topic. I think that all too often as you uh, follow these types of developments in the paper, uh, citizen interest catches up way too late. But obviously in this case, I think the citizens, uh, the immediate uh, residents that have been impacted, I think, uh, reached out uh, to the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, I believe, probably, and as well as the City Council with communication, uh, all of it very civil. And uh, again, I commend uh, citizen participation, and uh, I think that's uh, one of the assets of our community. Uh, our people pay attention. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the dais who has not yet spoken, ask questions, seek clarification, wish to do so. Otherwise, I'm happy to recognize council members who wish to speak for a second time. Ms. Mayor. I'm still not really clear on the the PUD. You said to um, to Alderman Bruno that uh, we might have missed it. I mean, it it is the developer's responsibility to find underlying zoning requirements on a site. It's it's part of the process normally, correct? Correct. When but when we did learn of it. We still move forward with the application because we felt it was worth making the argument that it was outdated and it was more important to meet the special use standards. I know that we politely disagree on that, but so we would have applied for that back in December or May when it was discovered. Okay. So, all right. You, you did know about it. You just did not apply for it no. in a timely fashion, so they had to delay the meeting. No, I would not say that. I would say that we filed, the city accepted the application, Chayden called us, said, there's a POD, we need to amend that, we're going to table the hearing, and then once you refile, we'll go back on the first available hearing, which was July 14th. That's what happened. But would we have filed that back in December? Absolutely. Yes. So, um... I work on construction sites, and when I use when I say we need to do this or we need to do that, and I mean you need to do that, um, I'm politely reminded that you know I'm not really doing anything. It's the people that I'm talking to that are going to. So, do you think Chayton meant you need to do that? You need to file for a PUD amendment? Yes. Okay. So you were using the global. Okay. Um, Do these towers come with more branches, or is seven layers of branches pretty much the standard? You know, I'd have to, we'd have to discuss it with the stealth company. Um, I know that if we will do everything we can to meet city's requirements, but there's certain engineering limitations, and without speaking with them or knowing the details, I can't answer that. But I can tell you that whatever all those discussions will be disclosed and if there are certain limitations we'll be able to explain why from the stealth and company so when you put this tower in what kind of foundation does it have well it all depends on the the geotech and you know whether it's just a standard it would be either 20 to 30 feet caisson that they would put in but again i'm not the engineer but from what i know of over the years that they'll do a geotech and they'll get a foundation design based on the tower design, which would be not only 
the loading, but also the wind loading from the branches and the antennas. So it's likely a caisson, though. Again, I'm not an engineer. I'd be happy to provide engineer drawings to you. <laughs> no, but I just, the reason why I'm asking is because during the planning and zoning me meeting, they discussed how critical the tree coverage is to the success of this concealed antenna looking decent. And, you know, my neighbors have pointed out that, uh, number one, during the winter, there's not as much tree coverage. Mm -hmm. And I fully agree with that, that it's primarily deciduous trees around the tower site. And number two, I just, I think uh, having done construction where there's large trees and a canopy, uh, tree preservation is a difficult business, especially when you're drilling a caisson. So you bring in a caisson rig near these trees that are important to the community to be able to not see the eyesore or it would, um, the sore thumb in the neighborhood and you drill a caisson right through where the root structure is for those trees, I, I just have to question whether or not we're really going to make it with those trees. I, driving home from uh, the train today, I saw on State Street about a, I don't know, probably a 50-foot pine tree down right next to State Street. Um, I saw driving to get my son some, some supplies. Uh, I saw in Fabian Woods in the Forest Preserve that there are about three dead, enormous deciduous trees right now, right along uh, the 31. So to me, the idea that the tree coverage is a permanent element that can support this concealing of the uh, tower is really questionable because trees die and those are really big trees and wind storms all, all of these things and then you drill a case on through its roots my god uh, something's gonna happen I'm sure of it a case on rig itself puts enough pressure onto the roots of the tree to really cause problems as well so um, anyway that that's I think that it's it's important that we consider that this could be standing alone in the future um, the main thing that bothers me is the, the fact that it doesn't look natural. Even if you were to improve the aesthetic value of the tree, of the monopine, the branches won't move in the wind. Uh, you know, people pick up on that almost immediately when you're looking at nature and it, it moves in a certain way and then you get this monopine and it's rigid and it's stuck in place. Um, it's never gonna look real. It's never gonna be authentic. That's all I got for now. Anyone else on the dais? Mr. Marks. Who chose the monopine over one of the other type of antennas? It's listed in your code as the, okay, the number one the, preferred option. It is. Those monopines do not really hide all those antennas. I mean, I saw it down in St. Louis when we were looking at another one before, and I was down in St. Louis, so I went and took pictures. I mean, you can see those antennas. Uh, from what I've seen, and from what I know, the antennas are painted green to blend in and match. Um, I, I don't know which. I know that they've made a lot of advancements in these tech, stealth technologies, so I don't know when the one, the one you the saw. The one I was by was by the fire station. I can't remember the name of the city. Um, right behind a fire station. Uh, right, but I don't know when that was built. Okay. So yeah. what I'm saying, it could have been built 10 or 15 years ago, and these companies have you know made a lot of advances in what they can design and build um, I know it's becoming more and more common as they get into residential areas as as the codes you know call out for it but the antennas are painted to match it doesn't completely engulf and hide the antennas you're gonna have the branches and the antennas inside if you're looking you're gonna see it sure um, so does that, and, and I guess, for lack of a better word, the flagpole, do those hold the same amount of antennas? No. Or? So the flagpole is limited because, you know, you want to have, you don't want it to be too thick that it looks like right. a, a yeah, rocket, it. right? Yeah. So you want to have it a thinner monopole to closely resemble a monopole, as best you can, is a flagpole. 
but the smaller you go, the smaller antennas and the less antennas that you can squeeze in there. So it would basically kill the opportunity for co-location. And it would also limit the coverage and the amount of antennas that Verizon can provide. It, it cuts down the, the, the amount of coverage. Oh, as well. oh yeah. Because, I mean, and most of those antennas. To, instead really of having a full array at 95 feet, you'd have to stack them array here and array here and go on and so forth. And then they're also limited to the type of antennas they can put up there because it has to fit inside the flagpole. So it really, it's not viable. And it's not something that we propose anymore because it just doesn't keep up with current technologies. Um, there was something that they proposed in the past, but they're shying away from. In fact, a lot of times they're asking to replace the monopoles. I was involved in a site at the Schomburg Golf Course where it was a, a flagpole, a light pole but they just couldn't provide the coverage that they wanted. So we went back through zoning and modified it to a full antenna array. And Schomburg was open to it because they were used to the site by then and they wanted the coverage. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to, because I, I was always my understanding that those antennas really picked up from the ground, not from the air. So that's why I was asking how much of the coverage. I mean, normally a cell phone is going to pick up from the ground area, not not really from an airplane. So it just cuts down the, the circle of what it will well, cover. It's, the, it's all line of sight. So the higher you go, the more that will cover. So the lowest one ends up coming down, what, about 50 to 50 feet, the, the tightest? Well, you would all, it just would, you'd stack, let's say, so you'd have three antennas at 95, then you have to have a separation, so then you go down to 85. Okay. And then, but remember, you're only getting three antennas in there. So that's a different type of antenna, it's a different type of coverage where you have one antenna facing one sector. So it's this way, if you have the full array, you can have a maximum of four antennas fa facing at 95 feet no, in southeast. three different directions, and that's so much better for capacity and coverage. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're Just welcome. clarification. I appreciate sure, it. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to recognize Mr. Marks for a second time, unless someone who has not yet spoken for the first time wishes to do so. Oh, I'm sorry. Good Lord. I'm happy to recognize um, anybody who has a dress shirt on for the second time. No? <laughs> Mr. Maladra, the floor is yours. All right. So we've made it. We've made a, a, we've talked a lot about the pole itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a question about the the facility. Mm -hmm. I, I call it a compound. Mm -hmm. um, so you're putting this facility behind a chain link fence with inserts. Mm -hmm. um, does the type of pole change the footprint of the facility at all? No. The requirements of the facility no. at all? Okay, so um, this is mostly for my partners on the council, but I whatever the pole is um, no matter how you look at that pole what we're looking at on this site is a utility use and a site that's not zoned for utility use on a parcel that's got prohibitions against special uses um, we do a great job like with our electric substations we've got brick walls and everything but you drive by and you still know it's not a playground it's not a place you want to you know, go have a picnic, it's a utility. And I think that that's another part of uh, where I trip up over what we're talking here is, you know, the pole is what the pole is. I actually think the Mount of Pine thing is kind of clever, but however you cut it, down at the ground, in their backyards, you have a utility. Uh, maybe similar to an electric utility or something like that. So, Correct, you have, you have equipment Oh, did you want me to come in? Or? No, I was on questions. Oh, okay. Okay. Anyone else on the dais? I have a, if the council would indulge me, a couple follow-up questions, if I may. Yes. And I'd like to ask Mr. DeGroot to please join us at the podium with Mr. Schenkel while I ask these questions. So bear with me. Yes. <clears throat> First question is this, and it's, it's, it's a clarifying question, but it is my understanding that the petitioner is responsible for pulling the title. Is that correct, Mr. Yeah, we Schenker? pull our title. We pull our own title. I don't know if a title is required with the application, though, is it? Or it's not. It's not. 
So, so Tower we North, have our title for our own. Report. Tower North pulled the title on this particular parcel of land. Yes. Okay. Did you pull that title prior to filing the petition with the city of Geneva, or did you pull the title after filing the petition? That would have been prior. Prior to. And when you pulled that title prior to, there was no notification, no knowledge of, no reference to special use with respect to the PUD. God forgive me, I was not reviewing that personally, so I'd have to defer to the team if and when they did. And I don't know if the right people are here to answer that, so I apologize. Just to clarify, is there anyone here who could answer that? If the answer is no, that's fine. I was just curious. The answer is no. Okay. You referenced that Mr. True, Chayton True, contacted you about some things missing in the application. Is that a fair statement? When we filed December 2nd, he reviewed it, came back asking us to make changes, whether that was to the landscape plan, different items with the design. We addressed those and then refiled. So we basically, he reviewed the application and wanted us to make certain changes. And the, again, to the landscape plan or addressing this or addressing that. So we complied, asked the Annie firm to make those changes to the landscape plan and clarify what trees or brushes we were taking out, things like that. Okay. Was there any reference to recognition that there was a PUD in place that did not allow for special uses? And if, in fact, there was, my, my gut tells me, that that would have also caused some sort of delay in terms of having to refile with the special use request. So Chayden told me verbally that he, they did catch that when we originally filed, but during the um, process of making the changes that they requested, when we refiled, completed the balloon test, and everything was accepted, then we moved forward with the notice. Chayden said, wait a second, we forgot about the PUD. Now, I didn't know it at the time. Mark was the one who filed it. But he, did, he told me over the phone, you know, actually, I did catch this when we originally filed, but it hasn't been discussed since. So it was then when we had sent the notice, he said, look, we're just going to table it. We want you to submit a PUD application with that, and then we'll put you on the next available agenda. So we complied. You... Uh, I want to be very clear and respectful, of course, but... And again, it's hard for me to reference because I know there was emails back and forth right. with this. But I, I want to pick up on something you said. Um, you referenced that, quote, Chayton also missed this, but is not the responsibility of... Right. I'm not blaming Chayton. Please don't okay. understand. I'm not, so I don't is it fair to, to say that, that the, the omission was and is owned by True North? I think that... Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Tower North. <laughs> yeah. Anybody works for True North, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I think that when we filed in December and we were working with the city, I think we should, yes, we should have... I, 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 again, I, Mark Lane and the team filed the application. Um, Ari and the law firm was involved in that and the back and forth. And it was, again, when I came in, when they notified... When we send out the notice of the hearing, that's when we said, they said, wait a second. We just realized as they were preparing their staff report that the PUD was not addressed. So they asked us to complete that application and pick up where we left off. I can tell you that the staff did not seem concerned with the PUD amendment. And looking at it and knowing what we were applying for, we were not concerned either. Uh, Mr. DeGroote? Is there anything that you want to add, clarify, correct, amend? Um, I mean, just in terms of time frame, that PUD application was June 23rd. I believe we received the digital copy, and then we got the checks the following Monday, I think. The um, PUD application for the special use was officially filed on June the 23rd? Check my calendars to make sure I Absolutely. got the dates right. Uh, Earlier in the evening, comments were made. Maybe it was March. Maybe it was April. No, I, I'm sorry. It would have been, it was a Friday, so that was June 24th. June and then 24th. we received 
the checks that course went with the application on the 27th. And when you refer to checks, you're so, talking about the costs associated right, with filing. So duly filed on the 27th. Right. June 24th, 2022. Correct. Anything else, Mr. DeGroot? I think so. Okay. From the dais again, anyone? Any questions, clarifications, curiosities for either the petitioner or Mr. DeGroot, city attorney, city administrator? Okay. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Members of the council, what say you regarding continued deliberations? Is there anything material you'd like to ask, hear about, Mr. Maladra? So, this is out there a little bit, but I would, I would propose we call the question. I don't know if you think that's premature, uh, but I think I get a sense of... Let me... Uh, let me let me allow the city attorney to address what a call the question is. A call the question is. So a call the question is if it's. Oh. So when you call the question, it closes debate. And so that means that then you would we'd move to a vote immediately, assuming that the call is, is, is seconded. And then you would move to a vote immediately on the matter uh, before the council. Okay. One moment, Mr. Malaja. We're going to double check something. Yeah, it's a vote to call the question, but we can comment. Yeah. And we can comment. And we can comment on calling the question first, though, right? We can discuss. Ladies and gentlemen, there, if a motion to call the question is seconded, the first vote taken by the council is a vote on calling of the question. That vote requires two-thirds of the council members present to vote in the affirmative, which means seven of the nine present would have to vote in the affirmative to call the question. If that vote is achieved, then we go immediately into a vote on the matter before us. There is a motion by Alderman Malaja to call the question. Is there a second to that motion? Second. second. Madam Clerk? You can give it to Swanson. Mr. Swanson makes the second. On the floor now is the motion as offered to call the questions. There's a question by Ms. Mayor on this matter. On this matter. Of calling the question. It's not a question. There's, there's, no, debate. there's no debate. Oh, there's forgive no me. Debate. There's no debate. It's just a vote. It's just vote. simply a vote. The debate has been arrested. There is no additional discussion. This is simply on calling the question. To be clear, there's no debate on calling the question. Got it. So with that, Madam Clerk, when you are ready, Point please take the. Yes, sir clarification because we have an alderman absent this evening what constitutes a two-thirds majority uh, could just so we have clarification on that please we also have mr. Sandek we will confirm that for you in a moment I think it's two-thirds I think it's two-thirds of the people that are pre present and voting but and I'm getting a nod from Ron, but it's two thirds of the people that are present and voting. And that includes the mayor or does not include the mayor? It doesn't include the mayor. It does? It does not. Okay. That's what I thought. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And for clarification purposes, two thirds of nine is? <laughs> the calculators are out. <laughs> <laughs> Proud Geneva we'll High School it. graduate, 1982. <laughs> <laughs> there's a motion there's a second to call the question all those in favor of calling the question will indicate by saying aye those who are opposed will say nay madam clerk please take the roll Maladra aye Marks aye Mayor nay Swanson aye Bruno aye Berghardt nay Ruby oh sorry Caven aye Kilberg? Aye. Kasserag? Aye. And the tally is, Madam Clerk? Tally is uh, two no's and seven yeses. There are seven in the affirmative to call the question. There are two in the negative. The vote stands to call the question. We move into 
the vote. Everyone's prepared? Let's clarify. How yes. This one is written in the, in, it's, I just want to confirm this is written in the affirmative gonna, so that a yep. nay vote is not looking for the tower and I vote is the tower goes in. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Caven is correct. Uh, okay. Most motions, in fact, virtually all motions, as you heard earlier in the meeting, are provided and brought to the floor in the affirmative. So we are voting on to allow for the special use and, of course, amending excuse me, amending the BlackBerry plan unit development and approving a special use for a wireless communication facility at 1800 West State Street. <clears throat> I vote means you support that recommendation. A nay vote means you do not. A simple majority is required. Any other questions? Which is, of course, six votes. So, Madam Clerk, whenever you're ready, please take the roll. No, it automatically goes to a vote. We do not. We have a motion on the floor already offered at the beginning of the meeting. Bruno? So. Bruno? Nay. Burghardt? Nay. Caven? Nay. Kilberg? Nay. Kasarag? Nay. Maladra? Nay. Marks? Nay. Mayor? Nay. Swanson? Nay. The final vote is zero aye votes, nine nay votes, one absent. The matter has been defeated. <laughs> Moving on to the agenda, ladies and gentlemen, we are at uh, item, we're at item pause for a moment. Uh, this is the time in the meeting for public comment and new business. Is there anyone here tonight with any public comment they'd like to share with the council and the tens of millions of people tuning in? From the dais, any new business? On what topic? Ladies and gentlemen, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn into executive session to discuss pending litigation before the city of Geneva. There's a motion by Kosarog. There's a second by Marx. A roll call vote is in order to go into closed session. Madam Clerk, please take the roll. No action will be taken concluding or at the conclusion of the closed session. Kosarog? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marx? Aye. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Bruno? Aye. Berghardt? Aye. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. We've been approved to go to closed session with nine affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and one absent. We're going to turn these microphones off for just a moment. We kindly ask, with all due respect, to clear the chamber. Mr. Miller, return the cup. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Motion to return to open session is in order. Is there such a motion? So moved. Mr. Marks makes that motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Bruno. A roll call vote would be in order to return to open session. Mr. Clerk, whenever you're ready. Aye. Marks. Aye. Mayor. Aye. Swanson. Aye. Bruno. Aye. Berghardt. Aye. Caven. Aye. Kilberg. Aye. Kosarog. Aye. Maladra. Aye. We're back in open session, ladies and gentlemen. Any new business? Anything last minute? I have one trivia question. Tonight, of course, is the anniversary of what? First oh. Chicago Cubs. Well, it was the scheduled <laughs> first Chicago Cubs. Um, uh, night game. Night game. Oh, who cares? And who, <laughs> yeah. And who did they play? 1988. It was against the um, Braves. Braves. Incorrect. Phillies. Phillies. Philadelphia Phillies. Phillies. Name the Phillies. three. <laughs> name the three players that slid across the tarp during the rain delay. Who cares? Is there a motion to adjourn? Grace was one. <laughs> Maddox. Grace. Jody Davis. Jody Davis. Yeah. Oh Maddox did too. Maddox and Jody Davis, and I can't remember who the third was. This is, this is your tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen. So, is there a motion to adjourn? So motion by everybody. We'll give that one to Kosarog. <laughs> all in favor of adjourning, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you all very much.